This is the time set for hearing on various motions. State versus Leslie Merritt, CR 2015-144211. Appearances, please. Good morning, Your Honor. Vanessa Losico and Edward Leiter on, for, on behalf of the state. Good morning. Good morning, Judge. Jason Lamb and Ulysses Farragut on behalf of Mr. Merritt, pursuant to Rule 9.1. We move to waive his presence for today's hearing. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Craig Hoffman from Ballard's Bar on behalf of the uh, intervening media companies. Good morning. Uh, Court and counsel had a brief discussion prior to uh, calling the case. There was a motion to dismiss with prejudice. There was a motion to vacate uh, the gag order or uh, motion to unseal records. There was a subpoena and there's a motion to return property. Uh, the court will deal with the motion to dismiss with prejudice and then the motion to uh, unseal records. Uh, there is a stipulation that we'll put on the record with respect to return of some property. Uh, and then we'll set a hearing on the other motions. Um, with respect to the motion to dismiss with prejudice, I've read all of the pleadings. Mr. Lamb, Mr. Farragut, Mr. Farragut. Sure. A month ago, you would have fi you filed a similar motion that you say that there's no uh, way that the state could succeed. And the court would tell you that that was a premature Rule 20 motion. Uh, what? Rule 20 being a ruling that would be with prejudice, double jeopardy protections. What has changed? Well, I think, you know, the motion uh, to dismiss with prejudice, judges, is primarily based upon a Rule 8 violation, as I noted in, in the motion. Uh, when the state filed a motion to dismiss without prejudice, it avowed that the motion was not for purposes of violating Rule 8. Well. Subsequent to that, we've learned through several statements and conduct on the part of the state that, in fact, uh, the purpose behind the motion to dismiss without prejudice was to avoid a trial that we had. I think the trial date was June 9th. As you are aware, Mr. Merritt was not going to waive any time, had never waived any time. The defense was ready. We were ready to go to trial, and we would have asked to uh, start impaneling a jury on on June 9th. Uh, what the state, through their statements, both through DPS, who's obviously an agent of the state here, through uh, the director, Milstead, he indicated in one statement, and again, I'm summarizing because I don't have the motion in front of me, but basically that the purpose of the motion to dismiss without prejudice is that they needed more time. They weren't ready to go to trial, and they needed more time for testing. Secondarily, um, a spokesperson for the county attorney's office made a similar statement that they were not ready to go to trial and that they needed more time for additional testing. The state should have put that in their motion to dismiss without prejudice, the fact that they were not ready for trial. In fact, the motion was for purposes avoiding a June 9th trial date and the fact that uh, uh, then we would have had an opportunity to object to that. Uh, that being said, there's additional information uh, we've asked the state to return the uh, defendant's vehicle, Mr. Merritt's vehicle. We've asked the state to return uh, Mr. Merritt's gun. And the state's position, as I understand it, is that those items are still necessary for testing. So every indication, both from the spokesperson, from DPS, uh, from the state, and through the various uh, statements and pleadings from from the prosecutors regarding the property is that they want to continue doing testing and that um, they were not ready for trial. We think that's a Rule 8 violation, a clear Rule 8 violation, and this matter should be dismissed with prejudice because Mr. Merritt should not have to continue to go through uh, the worries and the, and the concerns uh, and the torment, quite frankly, of wondering if he's going to get recharged uh, we were ready to go to trial. We insisted on a trial. And I understand the court's position about a Rule 20 issue, but quite frankly, Judge, there is no evidence against Mr. Merritt whatsoever. Um, and we were ready to go to trial. We should have gone to trial. If the state's position was we're not ready for trial, then we would have pushed for a trial date. So that's the basis of our motion to dismiss is that it is a Rule 8 violation, and, and we would ask that you grant that. In terms of the... Uh, prospect of Mr. Mr. Merritt having this hammer over his head, and that's unfair. Uh, 
I think the case law is such that that's not sufficient. That reminds me of the Max Dunlap situation where <coughs> after the uh, reversal, he sought to have an immediate trial, and that motion was denied, and he went to the uh, federal court, uh, and that motion was denied again. What What is different from that where you have a dismissed case, a defendant who proffers innocence, and if I just get this to trial, I can prove that innocence, uh, but the court and the law saying that that's not sufficient prejudice. I understood. I think this is a little bit different because, quite frankly, the state has made a false avow here. Uh, again, when they filed the motion to dismiss without prejudice, they avowed that it was not for any uh, purpose other than the interest of justice. They avowed that it was not to avoid Rule 8 speedy trial time. And so I think that's the difference. The difference here is that the state should not be basically uh, granted a, a gift, if you will, or a benefit, if you will, by simply saying, well, even though you avowed to this court that this was not for purposes of violating Rule 8, but you have, we're now going to go ahead and allow you to continue doing your testing because, quite frankly, they would have never done that testing for trial. And what they should have done is move to continue instead of moving to dismiss, and we would have objected to it, and we would have pointed out to the court that Mr. Merritt is ready to go to trial, that the parties have basically told the court that they would be ready for a, a June trial date. So I think that's the difference here, is that we have a clear-cut Rule 8 violation, where in that other case, there was no such violation. Isn't the most important issue unfair prejudice, and isn't that better assessed on the back end? If the state refiles the, the charge, how they file it, what they file it, then you can do a better analysis of what witnesses may have been lost, what uh, motions may have been lost in the whatever intervening time there is. Yes, I, I understand the court's position on that. I, I, I get that, Judge. And again, I can't stand here and tell the judge or the court that Yes, in fact, there is actual prejudice uh, moving forward. All I can tell the court, again, um, is it's a Rule 8 violation. It was an intentional Rule 8 violation, and the state shouldn't benefit from that. And, and then, you know, ultimately, I think it comes down to fairness. And ultimately, this court has to determine whether it's fair to allow the state to misrepresent uh, in its motion to dismiss that that basically it was for the interest of justice and not just be straight up with the court and tell them what the purpose was, which we would have obviously objected to, and, and have to put Mr. Merrick through this process. Mr. Merrick can't move forward with his life. Right now, all he can think about is, is the state going to be given the opportunity to refile charges against me? He can't move forward with employment. He can't move forward with schooling. He can't move forward with his family because all he can think about is, is the court going to give them another opportunity to basically come after me again. And that's just ultimately unfair, Judge. We should have, we should have gone to trial. If the, if the state's position was we want to continue testing, then we should have just moved forward to trial and not stopped the entire process and put Mr. Merritt through this uh, gauntlet of, of emotional roller coaster. Thank you. Ms. Losek, I know that the state had more chance to file a written response that that time has not lapsed. Uh, does the state want to make any statements today? I believe Mr. Leiter will be. Mr. Leiter. Your Honor, if the court deems it necessary for the state to file a response, we will. The state filed and included in our motion, it, the uh, dismissal was based on, not based on Rule 8, as we, we stipulated and we were explicit in that, but it was based on the evidence, and this happens all the time, happens every day in this, this courthouse, Judge. There's information that's provided to us. This court is aware of much of that information. And in the interest of justice, the state deemed it appropriate to dismiss the case without prejudice, and that's what we did. Um, there has been no, it is pure speculation on the part of Mr. Farragut to say exactly what were the motivations and that, in fact, what was in our written motion was false. Um, it was in the interest of justice, and it was the information that we had at the time, and that's how we proceeded. The court deems it appropriate. We will file a written response. Mr. Farragut, uh, it's your motion. You get the last word, sir. Judge, it's not pure speculation. I mean, we've got a statement, an official statement from the county attorney's office representative saying that the, basically the purpose was they needed to do additional testing and they weren't ready for trial. We have a statement from their agent, the director of ADPS, who says we were not ready for trial and we needed to do additional testing. Um, we've got the state through... Uh, they're pleading, saying, don't give back the gun, don't give back 
the car because we need more time to do additional testing. So this is not speculation. This is coming directly from the sources. And in every indication, regardless of what Mr. Leiter says here today, that it wasn't to avoid Rule 8, it was to avoid Rule 8. That's what everyone who has commented on this case from an official capacity has said, that they were not ready for trial and they wanted to do additional testing. So it's a violation of Rule 8. And the court shouldn't just, you know, gingerly say, well, you know, I'm going to allow dismissal without prejudice. There needs to be some impact. There needs to be some sanction on the state when they announce to this court that it's not for purposes of avoiding Rule 8, but in fact it is. There's got to be some sanction. I think the appropriate sanction under the circumstances, given the position we're in today, is to dismiss without prejudice. And in fairness to Mr. Merritt, he can then move forward with his life. I recognize the agency relationship that is discussed in some of the case laws relating to Rule 15, but the court does distinguish filings made by officers of the court directly to the court from statements made in other settings. Based upon the pleadings, the court finds that this dismissal was made for purposes other than to avoid Rule 8. The court finds that the presumption of without prejudice has not been overcome. However, it is without prejudice that should charges be refiled, the court, the parties would be allowed to do analysis of actual prejudice should actual prejudice be shown. So the motion to dismiss with prejudice is denied. Without prejudice to having a double jeopardy issue raised should charges be refiled. There's now a motion to unseal records. Mr. Hoffman. Yes, Your Honor. A hypothetical. There's a department of, there's a DR report that says that John Brown, who has the phone number 555-1212, lives at 100 West Washington, providing information related to the case. Public interest would be hindered if what is disclosed is there's a discussion with the person, initials JB, phone number 1212, lives on Washington Street. Well, Your Honor, if you reach the conclusion that revealing the full amount of information, the full name, full address, full phone number, would compromise an ongoing investigation, then the least restrictive way to reveal to the public, as is required by the Constitution, these public records would be to redact that information or make his name shorter, identified by individuals. For Your Honor, I haven't seen the sealed pleadings. I'm not sure if there's any information identifying any potential witnesses or any potential suspects. I read all of the pleadings. I guess the motion was filed by defense to unseal, so you guys get to go first and last. Mr. Lamb. Mr. Schwartzheim, we've had to reset your case. May it please the Court. Your Honor, the response boldly asserts that this is an open investigation. And assuming for the moment that's true, the open investigation has nothing to do with the defendant, and the specific pleadings at issue have nothing to do with anyone other than the defendant. If the Court would please take a look at the reply that I filed at page 3, there is a specific table wherein I listed the pleadings that we are seeking to be unsealed. So there is no guessing on anyone's part. We know exactly the items at issue. Now, first let me say there are not departmental reports involved. The Department of Public Safety has produced them pursuant to public records requests. Frankly, the county attorney has appended them to one of its motions. I believe it was the response to the motion to remand they filed on January 8th. There are no issues concerning confidential or personal information. The one document that contained any such information, phone numbers, which was a GPS mapping, those numbers are now defunct. They are no longer in existence. There is no one for the media or the public to call. I'm out on that. Just logistically, I think they, don't they recycle the numbers and some poor slug gets a phone call, doesn't know anything about this case because they've sold that number again? But I think that would be such a de minimis possibility 
You know, and if you're the subject of those phone calls. I'm sorry? Unless you're the guy getting the phone calls. Well, again, if the court, you know, suggested that I want to uh, redact the two phone numbers that are on the top of the diagram that was created by the FBI agent, I, I think that's a reasonable alternative. It's something that the court can do within its discretion, and it's something to which we have no objection. But with regard to the 102715 pleading listed in the reply, that only related to the defendant. The same is true with the November 9th pleading, the two November 11th pleadings, I'm sorry, the three November 11th pleadings. When we get to the February 17, 2016 pleading that was sealed, that was a motion for, uh, a sealed motion for court order discovery for various automobile records for a victim. Now, that motion, we do not provide any more detail about the victim's confidential information. The records that were produced were produced to us and disclosed under seal. Um, that one is, again, not going to compromise anything confidential or personal. The 317 motion, I'm sorry, that was an exhibit on 317 to the defendant's uh, Daubert motion. Uh, that was concerning the defendant's Facebook records. The 45 motion to modify release conditions. That was a defense expert. Uh, the motion in limine number one filed on 47. Again, that was as to the defendant's uh, GPS records. And, and I'll say that with respect to any of these items that I'm referring to thus far, Mr. Merritt waives any and all objection or interest that he may have in seeing that these matters are sealed. And then lastly, the defendant's motion to supplement his motion to modify release conditions filed 41816. That is the report. The, the relevant portion is a report of the state's independent ballistics expert. That is clearly exculpatory information. And that launches us into Times Mirror, the Ninth Circuit decision that we discussed. And briefly to remind the court, the Ninth Circuit was dealing with multiple media requests uh, concerning the unsealing of federal search warrant affidavits. And the Ninth Circuit recognized that there may well be targets of an investigation who have not been charged by the grand jury. And they have a right to privacy. They have a right to uh, keep their name pure and clean because they have not been accused formally of any legal misconduct, any crimes. And the Ninth Circuit really scrutinized those privacy interests. And I think the Ninth Circuit decision is in accord with the United States Supreme Court case law that I've cited in the reply. Mr. Merritt, on the other hand, he has been publicly accused, humiliated, embarrassed, and dragged through the mud. The documents that we're referring to only relate to him. They are exculpatory in nature. They are clearly exculpatory in nature. They do not relate to any other person under investigation. And I went through and I checked each and every one of them, and they do not. Mr. Merritt has, in fact, a greater right to have his name uh, not maintained uh, in its uh, pristine status, but restored to a pre pristine status because the charges have been dismissed, he is presumed innocent, and because he is in fact innocent based on the utter lack of evidence in this case. The state cannot create a de facto stay, if you would, an indeterminate de facto stay to hide the ball of the exculpatory information that clears Mr. Merritt's name. All he wants is his good name back. And by doing so, and in granting this motion, the court can aid in that with respect to documents that pertain only to him, that do not affect any open investigation with any other person. Sure, it may mean some egg on the face of the state, but that is not a, a, an issue for this court. And such a ruling would be consistent with Article 2, Section 11 of the Arizona Constitution. Thank you. Ms. Lucico? Your Honor, first and foremost, I think it's important for the court to be reminded that during the pendency of Mr. Merritt's case, both the state and defense counsel agreed that each of these documents be sealed. Um, based upon Rule 2.19, there obviously is a compelling state interest requiring that these documents remain sealed. Your Honor, this is an ongoing investigation. The evidence that the, the state has brought forward, provided to the defense, that the court is aware of and has a copy, led us to dismiss the case against Mr. Merritt. Mr. Lucica, let me stop you there. 
there are occasions when you have a pending investigation where the authorities make a, have a press conference to solicit the assistance of the public to help. Um, is that decision exclusively made by the executive branch and the court has no say on it, the, the press has no say on when that happens? I think that would be a case-by-case -case basis, Your Honor, quite frankly, and I don't think this is the case. Um, as it has been made clear in statements made by the county attorney's office, all counsels seated here in the courtroom, even intervener's counsel, are obligated to abide by Ethical Rule 3.6. And the reality is this is an ongoing investigation. Um, whether it be Mr. Merritt or another individual that DPS and the state has not determined it to be, the I-10 shootings still occurred, and there is no perpetrator of those shootings. At this point, it is very premature for us to sit here in the capacity in which this case is today and say whether or not any of these documents affect the ongoing investigation and then the due process rights of any individual who is brought before the court on these charges. Um, it is my understanding that um, DPS is working vigorously to determine um, more evidence in this case, and we believe that based upon the fact that this is an ongoing investigation, the ethical rules bind each of us to um, keep these items under seal. Additionally, I believe the local rule states it very clearly. There is a compelling state interest um, to ensure that whoever is brought forward on these charges, that their rights are protected. Mr. Uh, Lamb. Your Honor, when I heard counsel's response, I didn't hear a single fact that uh, suggested that Mr. Merritt was in any way responsible for the case or that the ongoing investigation is focused towards him. There has never been any legitimate evidence that he was responsible for these shootings. He is an innocent party. We do not keep things under lock and key hidden from the public. We are not in the Soviet Union. In fact, DPS has already released these reports to say that this is a very premature thing. That's exactly the argument I was making, Your Honor. They want an indeterminate stay to hide the ball. Nothing points to Mr. Merritt. Everything we're talking about is clearly exculpatory. I cannot imagine how information that shows Mr. Merritt is innocent would compromise the rights of any third party who may or may not ever be charged in the future. Are you pleading anything to add? Uh, just briefly, Your Honor. Uh, I just heard ethical rule or MRPC uh, rule 3.6 mentioned. Uh, that talks about extrajudicial statements of lawyers. That has nothing to do with, uh, with public records that are filed in this case. There's nothing in the, that model rule that says that um, public records should be hidden from the public. Uh, I also heard counsel of the state uh, admit that it's their burden here to show a compelling interest <coughs> in the record sealed and also that there's no less restrictive means to achieve that compelling interest. Now, the only two bases that the state has raised to keep these records sealed are that they could potentially contain witness names and they could potentially uh, contain identification of other suspects. Well, assuming that's true, Your Honor, and again, I haven't seen the records, uh, the records at least restricted means for protecting the public's interest would require nothing more than a redaction of the names. That would protect the First Amendment rights of the public and protect the integrity of any ongoing investigation. Thank you. This court issued a gag order to preclude out-of-court comments about the case by counsel and to prevent the public dissemination of any records, reports, interviews, and identifying information related to the case. The gag order was issued under the auspices of Rule 15.4D, the Victim's Bill of Rights, and the Sixth Amendment. The order overrode Arizona's strong public policy that presumes public access to government activities because there was a pending criminal case with a looming trial that would require the attention of untainted jurors. That circumstance no longer exists. The state asked the court to maintain the gag order because the investigation into numerous freeway shootings is still ongoing. While the court accepts that proffer as true, 
it is too generalized to overcome the strong public policy that presumes public access to the government activities. This court does find the fact of an ongoing investigation does raise a particularized need to not discourage folks who may have information about these incidents to provide that information to the authorities. Such discouragement would derive from allowing public access to the full names, telephone numbers, and locator information of folks who have been contacted related to this investigation. It is therefore ordered vacating this court's gag order with respect to out-of-court comments about the case by counsel, except as precluded by the rules of professional conduct. It is further ordered vacating this court's gag order with respect to public dissemination of any records, reports, and interviews related to the case. It is further ordered maintaining this court's gag order with respect to identifying information of individuals, telephone numbers, and addresses before disclosure of any record, report, or interview, redaction should be made that only initials are used to identify individuals, no more than four numbers of a telephone number are disclosed, and no full street address be provided except for the sites of the incidents being investigated. Because neither the clerk nor this court has the resources to make the redactions required by this order, the pleadings and attachments filed under seal related to this case shall remain filed under seal. The disclosures authorized by this order may be obtained from the publicly funded parties in the case. It is further ordered that grand jury transcripts and any exhibit admitted in the grand jury proceeding shall not be disclosed except as authorized by ARS 13-2812. Mr. Lamb. Your Honor, with respect to the redaction of identifying information, obviously Mr. Merritt's name is certainly a matter of public knowledge at this point, so I assume that would not apply. Well, at this stage, I see him as every other person that was mentioned to the extent that he waives his privacy, so LM becomes Leslie Merritt. That's his call. I don't think there would be much of a secret to the people in the back of the room if we left it at LM. The other thing, Your Honor, is does the court, would the court consider our refiling the sealed pleadings as public documents, noting the date of their original filing, after distributing the proposed public filings to the state with any and all redactions made first? However you wish to do it that complies with the order is fine. Very good. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Losica. Well, Your Honor, if that is going to occur, the state would obviously request that defense counsel provide the state with those redacted documents prior to any filing in order to comply with victims' rights. The fact that this case is dismissed does not eradicate the fact that there were victims in this case that still have rights under the Arizona Constitution, and it is the state's position that we seek to uphold victims' rights and ensure that those items are properly redacted. It wasn't intended, but the logistics of the order is going to take some time short of a stay. My order is as stated, and how the parties exercise its following it, I leave to them. If you're asking for a prescreening of it, that motion is denied. With respect to the return of property, I think there's an agreement that certain property may be disclosed or returned to Mr. Merritt. The other items we'll need to have a hearing about. Your Honor, the defense motion contemplates broadly three areas. First, the gun. Secondly, the car. And thirdly, personal property of the defendant that was on, in, or near his possession at the time of his arrest. Wallet, currency, other items in the wallet. Essentially, Your Honor, he just had cashed his paycheck. My understanding, and counsel will correct me if I'm wrong, is that the gun vehicle remained at issue. The defense will file a reply to the state's response that was filed late yesterday. However, as to the final category, the personal effects of the defendant, I believe the parties are stipulating to their immediate release. Mr. Leiter? That's correct, Your Honor. 
right. It is ordered granting the motion to release the personal property uh, to, of Mr. Merritt. That is his uh, wallet and co wallet contents, including currency and items in it. Uh, if a court order is needed to be signed, if you guys phrase it, I'll send it, I'll sign it. Uh, there's a motion regarding a subpoena issue. Uh, the court just gave us a copy moments ago, so I'd like a little bit more time to thoughtfully look at it. Off the record, just for scheduling, we need either a scheduling event or we want to throw the dart at the calendar and have a hearing. How much time to, on the car and gun issue? Judge, my reply, I, I'd like to say I'd have it done uh, by the end of this week, early next week at the latest. Then you have any hearing an oral argument? I would hope an oral argument, and if the court finds that additional facts uh, need to be adduced through live testimony as opposed to proffers, uh, it is probably more expeditious to set this matter for oral argument, at least initially, and the court could conceivably then adjourn to an evidentiary hearing if the court feels that more information is needed on the record. 30 minutes? That's fine, Your When we have 30 minutes on a Friday? <clears throat> Too far out? What time? Ten thirty. You could do the afternoon, Mister. What? One thirty. Okay. One thirty is fine. Will that work? All right. Back on the record, the court will set a hearing on the motion to return the uh, gun and car. June 17th at 1.30. Also, any issue related to anything else, if you submit um, me a heads up, I will have read what you needed to. Mr. Hoffman, you're standing. Is there something that you want to say? Sure, Your Honor. Just logistically going back to the, uh, the motion on seal, I presume the honors ruling was premised upon the constitutional right of public access to those records. Uh, and we don't have any assurance that these records will actually be refiled or unsealed because we're depending upon State and Defense Council. Uh, so I'm wondering if it might be appropriate to order that unsealed records be filed within a certain time frame to get this so actually the media can access the records rather than depending upon the State and Defense Council. Ms. Losico, is there a time frame? Well, Mr. Hoffman, it's your motion. What are you asking for? Uh, well, if the intention of the court was to have the parties uh, refile the sealed pleadings with uh, the redactions in place, not identifying personal information, phone numbers, or addresses. I'd like them to be ordered to refile those pleadings within a certain amount of time so that they can be examined. You've already said that. Give me a, give me a time. Uh, oh. I, I don't know how many uh, documents we're talking about here, so within 14 days? Mr. Lamb. No objection. Ms. Losico. Your Honor, I have an objection based upon the record I made earlier that if anything is going to be uh, refiled, that the state have an opportunity to ensure that the redaction is appropriate based upon the Arizona Constitution of Victims' Rights. Well, it, beyond not providing their locator information, only initials and uh, a part of a phone number, what other protections are you asking for? I, I'm not asking. I understand the court's order. My concern is, as an attorney who redacts victim information every day, I always have a double uh, set of eyes reviewing those redactions based upon the fact that in lengthy pleadings, lengthy documents, there's always the potential for something to get missed. And 
The state is simply trying to comply with victims' rights. I understand. There's a request that we do this in 14 days. What's your position on that request? Well, honestly, Your Honor, um, I don't know how long it will take defense counsel to redact those documents, provide them to me. Um, myself, I am starting a trial on Thursday that's going to last for six weeks. Um, Mr. Leiter has a, a trial starting in two weeks, so I, I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor, as I sit here. Mr. Lamb. I, I think I can propose a very realistic uh, solution. First, the items that are enumerated in my pleading, only one has to deal with a victim. Everything else pertains to the defendant, uh, and Mr. Merritt is waiving any challenges to any privacy interest for the reasons stated on the record. I think that it will take me no more than one week from today to give the state uh, proposed redacted copies of the filings, um, and then I can give them you know, another five days or so to put their eyes on it. And, and again, I only think it's going to be one pleading, and that would comport with uh, intervener's request, if that's acceptable. Well, you've said this a couple of times. As an example, if Mr. Merritt is talking even to his father, and the report reflects that, I don't mind it. Mr. Merritt can waive his rights under the gag order that I just modified so that LM is talking to BM. Not that no one else's name is going to be disclosed. And, and that would largely pertain to the 570 or 80 Facebook pages that are at issue. That'll be the only area where there's a rub, and we'll do it. Well, we'll I, it. I didn't want to have a confusion. I know Mr. Merritt has a right to waive whatever privacy rights he has, but and you do speak for him, but you don't speak for anybody else. And I wouldn't even attempt to solicit uh, waivers from all of his Facebook friends. Court will order that disclosure dis authorized by this order be uh, accomplished within two weeks, subject to a, uh, a stay. Thank you, Your Honor. And just for clarification, Your Honor, all individuals' names, address, and phone numbers need to be sufficiently redacted, not just victims, correct? Correct. Thank you. Because at this point, everybody's in the same boat as I see it. Uh, anything else for now, Ms. Losico? Not from the state, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Not for this record. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Hoffman. No, Your Honor. We are adjourned.